So welcome everybody to our international primatology lecture series on past, present, and future perspectives of the field. Uh, we're going to be getting to our fourth installment of this series here, where today we welcome Dr. Robin Dunbar, who's going to be giving us a talk on um, his process and, and some of the serendipitous things that led to some pretty influential discoveries actually in our field. My video disappeared, but I'm still here um, in terms of Dunbar's number and, uh, and, and a lot about our social lives and um, the processes and players that were involved in that. So to get us started, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Huffman as we always do to give the introductions before we get into it. So Mike, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Andrew. And welcome all of you to the fourth um, lecture in the series. And it's, it's, it's a great pleasure and an honor that we have Professor Robin Dunbar um, talking to us today, for us today. Um, some of you may not, not be aware, although you're all more than um, likely aware of, of the immense body of work that, that Robin has done. But in, his, in the early days of his career, back in 1979, he was actually um, here at, at PRI for several months working together with Professor Kawai and some of the researchers working with him in Ethiopia studying the gelato baboons. And Robin was doing his studies at about the same time. So Professor Kawai invited him over to, um, to spend some months with, with um, the team. And uh, several early papers came out of that work. But he was actually here on the fifth floor as a um, visiting scholar many, many years ago. I had heard about Robin's work for a long time before I actually met him. I think the first time we met was back in 1994 at Cambridge. There was a social learning conference and we had a, a party in the evening and Robin was sitting on the, in, in some of the, in, 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 in an area, this big open hall, um, nursing a glass of wine as I was doing standing, walking around, um, introducing myself and meeting people. And Robin called me over and we set up a conversation and then, um, it was really a nice experience, and I think about that quite a bit. Um, um, I was checking through Amazon today, just, just looking for books and things, and I came across Robin's long list of, of books, and I was, I was amazed at the many different languages that his, his work has been translated into, Japanese, of course, and for most of those books, I think. So for you students who are interested in looking for a... Um, role model for science communication, I think Robin is, is, is the best example we have in the field for his very um, prolific activity and scientific outreach to the public and um, professionals at, at many different levels. And I think we'll, we'll get to hear a little bit about those experiences and how that has impacted the science that he does. Um, and so without any further ado, I'll let Robin do the rest of the talking, please. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it's uh, good to be here. If uh, Oh, come on, what's going on? All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me just kind of give a quick pointer to, to what I think are the, the main messages um, that are going to come out of the talk. One is simply that discoveries in science are almost always accidents. They're, they're never planned. Um, but, and particularly in our end, very few of them. In physics, they can make very fine predictions from theory and, and it works, but I'm afraid at uh, the level of field workers or indeed most of the life sciences, this doesn't really happen. So they are just accidents. It's about being there at the right time uh, and the right place um, uh, for when the light bulb goes on, if you like. Um, but I, I always feel with, with, for us field workers really, just observation of the animals is absolutely crucial. If you don't if you don't kind of intuitively understand what it's like to, to be that animal, no, no matter what animal you're studying, then you never really understand the world that it lives in. In other words, you have to be able to sit inside the animal's skull, if you like, and see the world around it the way the animal sees it, and then be able to ask, why is that the case? And in the context of these why questions, sometimes known as Tim Bergen's four whys, it's extremely important not to confuse causes with consequences and constraints, uh, particularly in evolutionary analyses. And people do that all the time, I'm afraid, particularly in comparative analyses. Um, there's a kind of oddity in the way I've gone about doing my research, I think, in that everybody 
I guess, studies primates in order to understand humans. And I've always done the reverse. Uh, I, I've ended up doing a lot of things on humans, but it's actually in order to understand primates better <laughs> because there are things that we can do on humans that we cannot uh, do on primates. And so the, the kind of slipping between uh, different species like this and also into other mammals um, uh, has been really quite important for the development of my ideas. And lastly, biology is a multidisciplinary discipline. It, it, it's, it you know, has many different layers to it and you need to examine the different layers all the time. So you know, clearly function, evolutionary function is the core to what most of us do, the why question if you like, but you also need to understand the mechanisms, I think, to see why, how these functions are brought about in a particular case, because in, in understanding the mechanisms, we understand the evolutionary process. So those are the key messages. Um, how did I get into this stuff? Well, I, I, looking back now, in my old age, as they say, um, it's become obvious to me, which I didn't appreciate at the time, that my early life really was very important in allowing me to do what I did for a number of reasons. One is I grew up in East Africa in this place called Tanga up here uh, uh, on the top right hand corner of mainland Tanzania, Tanganyika as it was then. Um, uh, and I was very early on exposed to wildlife. So here I am aged about three with a wild monkey sitting on our veranda. Um, the, we lived among these animals um, all the time and, and got to know them very well. Here I am in uh, age 17, I think, out in the bush um, uh, hunting. This is actually a, an 80, 1890s uh, matchlock. <laughs> um, here's the powder horn. This is This is, uh, an extraordinary piece of equipment we found that these two guys had. Here's the powder horn. So this is a muzzle loading, push powder down the front end, then you stick a ball bearing down it and you've got a, a, a match lock uh, uh, here um, uh, like they had in the early 19th century. This is an old Arab rifle, basically. Um, but we spent a lot of time walking around these kind of habitats, really understanding the nature of the habitat and how the animals lived in them. And also living up here in northern Tanzania is very close to um, Olduvai Gorge, the, the big area that uh, the Leakies really discovered in the early 60s, the, the uh, Australopithecines, the East African Australopithecines. So these, these things were the talking point. People talked about these kind of discoveries all the time out there because they were there. So I, I was really very embedded into kind of human evolution stories, even in my childhood. And finally, um, I realize now growing up in, in what was an extremely multicultural uh, environment um, was really very important because it allowed me to switch from one culture to another. I, I would consider myself a four culture person really, because although I clearly grew up and my family was, was as it were, British uh, uh, culture, um, British are rather few in number out there. In fact, there were probably more other Europeans uh, in, in um, Tanganyika in particular than there were uh, British, but also there's a very large number of Indians. We were very heavily embedded in the Indian uh, community because my father grew up, was born and grew up in India. Um, there was a big Arab uh, 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 culture because being on the coast and the trading for, for many centuries or a thousand years probably. And then of course Swahili culture and, and I was deeply embedded in Swahili culture um, to the point where I wrote poetry in Swahili in Arabic script, which is what they used in the 18th century. And this down here on the right, lower right is one of my uh, Swahili poems. Um, I could no longer write now in Arabic script because it's about 50 years since I did it. But there we go. But these, these in kind of environmental influences at a very young age, I think, allowed me to switch from being in one kind of cultural mindset to another. And that was very important in studying animals because it could easily move into their kind of mind state, if you like. 
So I, I started to study uh, primates in particular as an undergraduate. I, I did two field studies as an undergraduate, one of baboons in Ethiopia, 1968, and one of baboons in Senegal the following year. And then I did my PhD. I did my PhD on uh, these animals here, the gelada, uh, with the um, Professor uh, Kawai's group coming through in between our two visits. We just sort of overlapped. Um, uh, um, up here in the um, neighboring uh, ridges, really, up in the Simeon Mountains in northern Ethiopia. So this is me here sitting in the middle of um, uh, uh, a gelada herd. But at the same time, uh, I also worked on uh, black and white colobus, um, not in this study site, but in another study site um, uh, where they were very abundant and we were working on uh, uh, gelada in, in, in a different area. Um, and also clip springer, which were extremely abundant up here. I first began to work on these. Later, I did a full, full-time study of them in, in uh, Kenya uh, in the 1980s. But these little monogamous antelopes are, are really very fascinating and very enlightening uh, from that point of view, from understanding monogamy, I think, or, or obligatory monogamy in, in antelope. And then I spent a lot of time studying wild goats, feral goats in uh, Scotland and in, in North Wales, right through really from the 1980s on and off through till about 2007, when I finally stopped doing field work. But in the meantime, I'd been working increasingly on humans. So the story of the, the, the social brain, um, it's interesting that in 1992, give or take a year. Uh, so I think the first paper was published in 1991 and the, the last of the series in 1993, but basically all the work was done around 1992. Um, I had four ideas, which I thought at the time were unrelated to each other. Um, they were the idea that time was more important than anything else for animals. And I spent a lot of time building time budget models, which we've gone on to do for, uh, I think we now have time budget models for 12, primate genera, all the great apes, uh, most of all the African uh, uh, genera of monkeys, um, uh, one South American uh, genus of monkey, and uh, feral goats, so one ungulate. Um, and these really look at the constraints that time imposes on um, the time that animals have available for social interaction, therefore creating their social groups. Um, at the same time, I started working on the social brain hypothesis. It came as an idle uh, thought, actually. Um, I, I was uh, trying to solve the problem of why primates spend so much time grooming, which I believed was a bonding mechanism, not just hygiene, although it obviously does clean the fur, but the real purpose was bonding. And I was trying to think of ways of testing that hypothesis, and the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis had recently been proposed, and I thought, well, um, if if um, uh, grooming is has main function is is um, social bonding, then there ought to be a three way correlation between grooming time, brain size, and social group size. And and slightly to my surprise, there was and there was this very tight relationship, relatively speaking, between group size and brain size. And that set me off thinking about the social brain hypothesis. This whole issue of grooming. Um, as a bonding mechanism, and particularly the uh, neuro um, uh, and neuropsychological mechanism or neurophysiological mechanisms that underpin grooming as a bonding mechanism that also gave rise to the gossip theory of language, if you like. And then finally, Dunbar's number, which, which spawned uh, um, perhaps uh, more ideas than anything else. I, I think my, my um, most um, entertaining. Um, uh, consequence of Dunbar's number is there's, there is a, a, um, a, a software, uh, an internet um, uh, um, silent handshake security mechanism known as Facebook, which was developed off the back of it. But there are also two bot detection mechanisms that are based on Dunbar's number and the fractal structuring of social relationships on the grounds that bots don't have natural social networks and only humans do. And those, those, those uh, um, uh, bot detection mechanisms are actually more successful at detecting bots than all the other 
mechanisms that uh, algorithms that had been developed. But anyway, roughly speaking, um, um, these various four, four different things have, have produced a huge number of papers really, but most of them are now collaborative papers with other people. Um, you can see the number, but that, what I came to realize in the end was that these four are actually four legs of the same story. They're the four legs on which social evolution really in, in primates in particular, but mammals in general, but primates in particular are based. Okay, so back to the social brain, what's it all about? Well, it seemed to me we have three things to explain here. One is, why do primates have bigger brains than all other uh, animals, and particularly other, other mammals? And is it really the case that primates uh, need a big brain um, to uh, find food? Are they ecologically smart, really smarter than squirrels, which are probably among the smartest of the, if you like, the lower mammals, as we might uh, think of them? Secondly, why do primates have absolutely bigger brains, or why do some primate species have absolutely bigger brains than other primate species? So why do um, chimpanzees, for example, have bigger brains than monkeys, and why do monkeys have bigger brains than, let's say, uh, some of the prosimians? And then finally, why do we uh, find certain specialized areas in the primate brain which we don't find in other species? And the two most important are probably <clears throat> this point here, what's known as the frontal pole, or Brodmann area 10, which is unique to anthropoid primates. The prosimians don't have it, and the calatricids don't have it either in the South American monkeys, but all the other anthropoid primates have this area. It's what allows them to do causal reasoning. It's what allows them to do analogical reasoning, one trial learning, and inhibition. It's what allows them to inhibit. And we've come to see inhibition as crucial for living in social groups, because you have to be able to inhibit your natural tendency to want to take the big slice of the cake. This is, this is if you like, um, the evolution of politeness in monkeys and apes and of course humans. So this capacity to allow somebody else to have some share of the benefits of living in the group without trying to steal all the benefits is crucial to keeping or allowing a group to keep together. And that's the problem they have. Uh, it's, it's enabling the group to remain together as a single unit to provide the function that's necessary for the animals. And then the other key anatomical thing is this uh, so-called mentalizing network, uh, which is this huge chunk connected by a massive great white matter um, uh, uh, wiring, if you like, um, which involves the prefrontal cortex up here, including the frontal pole, um, the temporal parietal junction up in here and the, the temporal lobe here. And, then, and we've seen since come to realize that this is also deeply connected into what's known as the default mode ne network, which goes uh, from up here in the prefrontal cortex into the limbic system down behind here somewhere. Um, so you have this sort of hugely complex system. And that turns out to be fundamentally important for social reasoning, basically. Um, and Monkeys, at least macaques, where the primate work has been done in humans, have exactly the same system. Okay, so here's the original analysis I did on the uh, social uh, brain hypothesis, plotting mean group size for a species against neocortex ratio, um, just putting a regression line, but this is not the conventional least squares regression line, which will run across here uh, at a much lower angle because of the scatter in the data. Uh, but using a, a, um, a reduced major axis regression, which tends to put the line up the center of the tube of data, as it were, um, uh, is the one I used. And I had the idea, uh, and this was probably something like three o'clock in the morning after a long night um, uh, analyzing this, to, to ask, well, what happens to humans? We have humans in this same database. We can plug them in. Oh, and, and by the way, I, we, we showed later that this, quantitative relationship only applies to mam to primates. It does not apply to mammals, other mammals in general, and it doesn't apply to birds either, where, where the same principle applies, there's still a social brain hypothesis, but it's not a quantitative relationship between group size and neocortex ratio. It's simply a reflection of monogamous systems. In all these other species, monogamous uh, species have bigger brains than polygamous species, but that's the end of it, with the possible exception of uh, the dolphin uh, whale family. 
Um, but if we plug humans in, we get uh, a prediction of that of about 150. Um, that's the number that's become known as, as Dunbar's number. Does it exist? Well, the answer is yes, surprisingly. <laughs> I was a bit doubtful. I thought it was much too small a number for humans, but actually um, we and other people have spent the last 30 years uh, testing this in many different contexts. Uh, and we come up with a value of 150 consistently over and over again. So here's one data set of ours. This is a national cell phone data set from one large country. So there are 6 million subscribers in here. It's based on 6 billion calls uh, over the course of a year. Um, we take reciprocated calls as indicative of a, a relationship. So you have to call back to the same number at some point, otherwise it doesn't count as a relationship. And when you look at that, you get a nice bell-shaped curve. The, the sort of green uh, smear is all these 6 million subscribers uh, squashed in there, but the mean is right above uh, 150. And here's um, uh, an analysis of number of friends on Facebook by Stephen Wolfram, who's a kind of major analyst of, of online uh, and Facebook in particular data. This is his data, nothing to do with me. He did this long before, um, or at least completely independently of the social brain hypothesis and Dunbar's number. This is the distribution of the number of friends on Facebook for a million Facebook users. And the peak here, he said the, the modal value is between 150 and 250, which is uh, good enough for me, um, particularly as given the age group, because we now know that um, although the average is 150, the range is from about 100 to 250. And younger people who are the main Facebook users tend to be at the top end. So this is where you'd expect it to be. But I just discovered this paper was actually published 10 years ago, and I never noticed it. Um, but there's a very nice analysis. It was actually a, a very infamous experiment done on Facebook, which caused a lot of uh, uh, row and, and, and um, uh, attack uh, by people uh, because of the way they'd manipulated people's feeds. But buried in there is an estimate of the size, the mean size of uh, the number of friends on Facebook. And this sample is 61 million Facebook users and the, uh, the, the mean is 149. Thank you, it doesn't come any better than that. I'm ha quite happy. But we also know now actually that, that 150 is an, what the mathematicians would call an attractor. Uh, it's a point where, if you like, the system is drawn to because of some feature of the system. And that feature is information flow. So we published a paper last year with some physicists showing that if you look at the structure of actual social networks in humans, the flow of information through the network is actually optimized at a size of 150. Uh, it, it sort of converges to that point. So. Um, I, 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 at this point here, at exactly 150, the system collapses um, and, and goes back to kind of random uh, processes as well. And it's probably because the system fragments at that point and you no longer have an integrated uh, network or community. Um, but the fact that it, it does this suggests that there's either a cognitive limit or a time limit or both, and, and both is probably what the answer is. However, here we are living in social groups, uh, uh, along with all the other primates of a particular size. Uh, the problem for all mammals is that living in groups has costs. And those costs we usually think of in terms of day journey length and competition for food, these kind of things. Um, uh, but actually, it turns out that this is much less problematic for them. And we've literally only just discovered this. The paper showing it is, is not yet, uh, um, is still in the review process, um, is that living in groups destroys female fertility. Uh, and it seems to be a consequence of stress created amongst the females themselves, because the, the, there's a positive effect on fertility of group size, which is why they live in groups. But there's a negative effect of the number of females in the group which is the cost. And it, it is so strong in mammals in general that mammals cannot live in groups bigger than uh, five to seven females. It simply can't be done. That sets an upper limit on group size for mammals in general at about 15, which is exactly what you see, except in the herding species, which is one way of solving this problem. Primates, however, have uh, 
gone in a different direction, and that is using bonded coalitions to buffer themselves against these stresses and so allow themselves to live in, in large bonded groups. But here are the kinds of stresses. Here are some of our gelada, one harem here, uh, squabbling with the harem, another harem over here. Uh, these are the uh, Kashima Japanese macaques. Um, and you can see here's the dominant male going off uh, towards this, this lady here. Uh, because uh, um, uh, he knows very well that she has peanuts in her pocket. She always does uh, for them. But everybody else, look what they're doing. They're all watching him, and these ones are moving out of his way. They know what's going to happen. They don't want to be in, in the way. Um, so this is all these kind of small level uh, stressful things, sometimes big level stressful things, are just a constant problem that you have to cope with. And we can see this in or the response to this really in terms of bonded social groups so this is an analysis that Suzanne Schultz did um, uh, some years ago in which she looked at the rate of brain evolution over geological time since the first appearance of the order so this is over you know 60 million years for primates 20 million years for ruminants uh, and so on how fast did uh, brain size grow over time uh, and uh, uh, what proportion of that order's living species um, have bonded social groups. And you can see there's a very tight, actually, linear correlation between these two. Anthropoids sit right at the top. Prosimians are way down. They're, they're not in the same league as anthropoids. In fact, the camelids, um, um, the camels and alpacas and so on, uh, do better, as do the, the, the equid family the horses, zebras, and the dolphins. Um, but some species, the um, uh, cats, the uh, ruminant uh, antelopes and deer, um, the dog family, um, don't have uh, bonded social groups in this kind of way. This is, this is how these species have solved the um, stresses of living in, in large groups, and the anthropoids have really come out right on the top. So what are they doing? How are they doing this? Um, it's become clear to me over the years that what's going on here is what psychologists would call a two-process mechanism. Um, uh, it should say a two-process mechanism but in there, but it's, it's being cut off, I'm afraid. Um, uh, that the, the mechanism used in creating social bonds in primates uses two separate processes which have different neural pathways in the brain, but which support each other. So they work in tandem. One is this stuff here, social grooming or just physical touch stroking in, in the case of humans, but social grooming in the case of primates. And this creates an, an emotionally very intense basis or platform off which to build relationships. And it does that through the endorphin system in the brain. Um, and the second component is a cognitive component. It's given that they are able to spend a lot of time with each other, then they can build, uh, what they're doing in effect is building cognitive relationships of trust and obligation and, uh, and reciprocity. And I'll just go through each of those uh, very quickly. Uh, the endorphin system in the brain turns out to be really interesting and, and much more important in social context uh, than um, any of the other neurohormones that everybody gets excited about. Um, this is, this is a, a, I mean, we know from the primate research from other people that grooming and several different labs that grooming triggers the release of endorphins in the brain. So uh, along with my collaborators in Finland, Lauri Numenmaa uh, and his lab, we ran a bunch of humans through uh, um, PET scanning, which is pretty nasty stuff, and um, which we had uh, a partner of the person just lightly stroking the, the torso, the chest and, and stomach while, uh, while, while the person was in the, the scanner. And here are the brains lighting up, just going crazy, absorbing endorphins that have been triggered by um, a light, so stroking. And, and this is done through a very specialized neural system, the C-tactile neural system, or, or more correctly, the afferent C-tactile neural system, because it has no return loop. It differs from the usual pain type uh, peripheral nerves 
in that it's only one way. There's there's no return loop, motor loop back down to, to the thing. It responds to only one, it's very slow because it's unmyelinated. Um, and uh, it responds only to one stimulus and one stimulus only. And that's light slow stroking at exactly 2.5 centimeters per second. And that's the speed of hand movements uh, uh, during grooming is, as the animal uh, pushes the fur aside to, to, to look uh, uh, at the skin surface beneath as it were. If you do it, if you stroke slower or faster than that, the neurons do not respond. And these, this, the, although this is a mammal-wide effect, um, it, it's really exploited heavily only by, by the, the primates and some other species, for example, the horses do a lot of grooming with each other. Um, uh, the problem with grooming is it's kind of very limited in who you, you can do it with. You can only groom one person at a time. So that really imposes a limit on the number of individuals you can groom with and therefore the size of group you can have. Uh, and we were interested in how humans really got above the limits that we see on group size in primates, which is around about 50, 50 animals. Uh, how, how do we get up to 150? And we estimate from the various equations how much grooming time you would expect of all the fossil uh, humans here. Um, uh, these, these are not modern, modern, well, the blue line is what you'd expect to see in modern humans if we just bonded all our relationships by grooming, but, but the, these modern humans are actually fossil modern humans, so taking the uh, brain sizes, calculating group size from that, and then calculating grooming time from that using the equations relating these, these variables. And you can see it's going up here, but we have this big gap because nobody, including humans, Modern humans spends more than 20% of their day engaged in, in um, social interaction. And what we now think has happened is at various stages during this time, we've introduced new and more ways of uh, triggering the endorphin system. The oldest is laughter. It's something we share with, with great apes in particular, and it's very visceral. Uh, so we uh, it's involuntary. We, we can't stop laughing if everybody else laughs. It's kind of like a form of chorusing, a bit like howler monkey chorusing, polite, quiet howler monkey chorusing, singing without words, so humming if you like, uh, uh, and dancing. And then after the appearance of language, which, which is very late uh, in human evolution, we get the rituals of religion, feasting, together, eating and drinking of alcohol together, and storytelling. And we now know, uh, because we've, uh, let's just say, the, these three blocks, we think, come in to allow these uplifts at these three particular points. But we now know that all of these trigger the endorphin system, and more importantly, they increase the bonding, sense of bonding, to the people you do these activities with. They don't change your sense of bonding to the people who are not there. Even your best friend is a very specific uh, lead to the people you're actually engaged in this activity with. So these are the sort of uh, attempts by our ancestors, if you like, to increase the size of the group we live in or they lived in using the same basic neurobiological uh, mechanism, but having found out, if you like, and, and this is certainly historical, the, the, these are things we've learned. This is probably genetic, but these are all things we've learned uh, how to do. Um, that we've learned how to trigger the endorphin system with a lot of people simultaneously, which overcomes the constraints of physical grooming. Um, we've done an awful lot of work on uh, neuroimaging uh, in collaboration with various people, but since, in addition, so have other people from other labs. There's about a dozen neuroimaging studies now of individual humans, which has shown that the size of your personal social network correlates in particular with the size of the mentalizing network uh, in particular, but also in especially so the prefrontal cortex up here. Um, and there's Rodman's area uh, 10, the frontal pole up in here uh, um, as part of that. Um, but we also now know uh, from other people's work that the, the default mode network is part of that system. So it's this huge complex. It's a massive, massive neural uh, um, uh, loop, as it were, um, connected by huge uh, fiber pathways. 
And it doesn't seems not to matter uh, how you measure the social network. So we've often used just the inner core of the network. Other people have used the uh, Facebook number of friends on Facebook. Um, I think the, the um, uh, prize goes to uh, these guys, Quack et al, who, who um, sampled a complete co Korean village, everybody in the village, and then um, for their social networks and use the incoming uh, um, uh, um, uh, likes, if you like, uh, 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 to estimate the number of friends that somebody has had. So rather than asking you how many friends do you have, they ask how many people think you are a friend of theirs. And that's your friendship number. And then they scanned the brains of um, a large proportion of these, these villagers and showed that, again, uh, this big loop here in the mentalizing network correlates with the number of friends you have. And two, two labs have now done the same for macaques and baboons. So this is Jerem Saleh's uh, study of captive macaques. And, and this is uh, the French group that, that have looked at um, semi-free ranging baboons. So and essentially the same thing. Well, in their case, they looked at total brain volume. Um, the animals that live in, uh, lived in bigger groups within these captive colony uh, had uh, bigger brains. Uh, Jerome Sale looked at the actual um, size of different brain units uh, and showed that uh, the size of individual social networks, if you like, correlate with the size of key um, brain regions, and particularly those that are associated again with the mentalizing circuit. So the other big part of the story, which has taken us a long, this, this has actually taken me 25 years to show that this is the case. I first realized the, the issue, if you like, in 1993, and I said so in print in 1993, we have only just published. In fact, the paper showing it uh, was finally in print today. <laughs> I got an email from, from, from the, the journal. But when every, anybody looks at the um, uh, social uh, brain data, uh, the, the group size to brain size, um, relationships in primates. They assume it's a single data set. Uh, but when you look at what, who's, what, uh, who these species are, it becomes very obvious that this is not so. And in fact, what we've now been able to show, and the problem with showing this statistically is the big problem, is that uh, this apparently single set of data really consists of four grades, four separate grades. There's a bunch of... Uh, uh, of relatively unsocial primates out here. There's a bunch of very social primates, which are mainly great apes out uh, here. And then in between are kind of two separate layers of um, increasingly intensely social primates. So this is, yeah, and what's interesting about these is these are not taxonomic. It cuts across taxonomy completely. Yes, these are prosimians, but these are South American monkeys in these uh, grades here, you've got a complete scatter of prosimians, South American monkeys, uh, Afri uh, old world monkeys, and, and occasionally the odd ape in some of the data sets. And, and or mostly these are apes in, in this data set. Uh, and there's humans up, up here sitting on this, essentially sitting on this, this fourth most intensely social grade line. Now, the interesting thing is we've been able now I mean, this is Stefan's original data set, but we've got more data sets available now. So we've been able to do exactly the same analysis on altogether five different measures of brain size, if you like, uh, from uh, four different compilations of brain data in primates. Um, these are cranial volume data. Uh, this is Navarette's recently published uh, neocortex volume data. This is non-visual uh, neocortex, so it's the sort of frontal end uh, uh, of primates from Stefan's database, and, and this is frontal lobe volume uh, from the Rilling database, and all of these show the same patterns. And I, what I kind of want to draw your attention to is how tightly these um, uh, values sit around these grades. They're, they really aren't scattered, um, but these grades differ in brain size, in group size, and differ significantly in this respect, in bondedness, the proportion of bonded uh, uh, um, species with bonded social systems, 
in measures of social cognition and the two we use are mentalizing and, and inhibition and finally in habitat pr predator risk. So what seems to be happening is as primates are invading more and more predator risky habitats, they're being pushed along this dimension here to develop bigger groups, uh, but to, in order to develop bigger groups, they're having to develop the kind of behavioral and cognitive mechanisms that allow them to hold those groups together so they don't become dispersed. Um, and that is why you get this relationship between group size and brain size. Um, and this fact, uh, well, kind of emerging out of this really was, and, and I guess we first showed this in humans, we hadn't kind of anticipated it at all, but it just came out of the looking at human social networks. But all primates have a fractal structure to their social groups. And by fractal structure, I mean a picture that looks a bit like this. You've got all the individuals here and they gather together in different grouping levels uh, with the grouping levels themselves gathering into higher grouping levels. So you've got several individuals here, let's say that form a coalition, they groom a lot together, they protect each other, they help each other out if you like. And then several coalitions make up a reproductive unit, a harem, several harems make up a team, several teams make up a band and several bands make up a community. And this was first published in one of our very early papers with uh, Kawai Sensai, um, as a result of that visit I made to um, um, PRI back in 1979. Okay, so uh, uh, when we look at the pattern of these um, grouping levels in different species of primates against these grades, it's very clear that these grouping levels, the, the sizes of these different units lie on, on these grades, not on uh, not scattered amongst them. So here are data, for example, for Hamadryas and Gelada, which are well known to have this kind of hierarchically structured fractal setup. Um, they, these, the, the values of these sit on or very close to specific grades. Um, uh, these are data for chimpanzees, which we now, now have turn out and gorillas, which also turn out to have this kind of structure. And here are the data for humans over here. And then these are some Gwenans, African Gwenans and Colobines from Africa and, and uh, Asia, which if you look at species which uh, live in large groups and small groups, related species, then they turn out to sit on these grades. So if I can um, uh, identify uh, the right set, I think this is uh, Colobus monkeys. Um, no, this is Colob Colobus monkeys in Africa, which live in small groups. And here are Procolobus monkeys, which live in large groups in more predator risky, poorer quality habitats. And it looks like that what's happening here is to create these larger groups, they're simply holding subgroups together from the standard type. Create, so rather than a group fissioning and half the group disappearing, the group stays together. And that causes them then to sit on these, these grade lines. So these grade lines act as attractors. And it turns out there's another fifth layer down here. Um, so these are grooming, these are grooming uh, coalitions in these species, um, what are called neighborhoods, female neighborhoods in, in ch the chimpanzee research. Uh, humans, this is um, uh, uh, the size of your kind of basal social, social grouping. So only certain group sizes are possible, but as you go up through the layers, so the bonding gets weaker and weaker and weaker and uh, less and less stable, which is why up here, the Hamadryas and Gelada can form these flexible um, uh, herds, as it were. And, and that seems to be the point is that this fractal structure allows great flexibility without losing social cohesion. And it turns out, if you look at the size distributions for primates as a whole, so this is the average mean species group size for every species of primates, then these turn out to have this fractal, fractal structure as well. This is not, these are not normal distributions. They turn out to be um, a number of overlapping, partially overlapping Poisson distributions, so skewed distributions, but with very strong peaks. And these peaks occur at around 5, 15, and particularly 50 in the anthropoids there appears to be a grouping somewhere in the middle at about 30. And the same is true of the prosimians, just sit down here at the bottom. Um, they, they have peaks at uh, two and a half, 
uh, uh, around about five and about 15 again. And that turns out to be the structure of your social network. So this is from our work on human uh, social networks. What we find is, is this kind of structure. You sit in the center of a series of expanding circles. The smallest one around you has about one and a half people in it. That's because some people have two intimate friends. Some people only have one. So the average turns out to be about one and a half. Uh, uh, it, it, there's a, a, a circle of, uh, whoops, uh, um, very close friends about, or friends and family, remember, about five people, uh, about 15 uh, good friend, best friends, about 50 good friends, 150 friends. So here's Dunbar's number. Um, and this, this circle really defines the limits of altruism, it turns out, and emotional bonding. And then beyond that, we know there's a circle of 500, uh, which we call acquaintances. And then beyond that, we know there are two more layers in humans, one at 1,500, one at uh, 5,000. Um, but these layers are very, very consistent. You see them in all data sets and they're driven primarily by how much time you devote to them. So these are the average rates of contact per, per day for each individual in each of these circles. And you can see this, this inner core uh, uh, of five best friends and family here. You, you see contact much more often. In fact, you devote 40% of your social time, social effort and your emotional capital as well to these five people and then another 20 percent to the 10 people these these numbers are cumulative by the way the 15 includes the five it's not an extra 15. Um, you devote another 20 percent of your time to the extra 10 people in this circle here so that 60 percent of your social effort is devoted to just 15 people and the quantity declines as you go out but those frequencies turn out in humans to be crucial for keeping these layers together. If you don't see somebody at the specific uh, frequency of contact required for this, this layer, let's say, they will drift down very quickly within a matter of months into the layer below. So it's a very, very time costly relationships. We've shown these layers exist in Facebook data. It's a very old Facebook, publicly available Facebook data. So it, it, it's from the, about 2009, I think. So just after Facebook started, people didn't have their sort of full networks on there. But you can see if you look at the postings in there, you get this layered structure. These, these are Twitter data. So these are conversations going on within Twitter accounts between the followers. Uh, these are cell phone data, national cell phone data. Um, uh, uh, from an entire country, it's again very large samples. These are our estimates from face-to-face -face interactions, that's asking people to list all their friends. And here, exactly the same numbers reappear in modern armies. This is the structure of modern armies here that you're looking at. And lo and behold, here fractal group sizes in the structure of primate social groups, they just sit on these lines. There's something weird and odd about these numbers that makes them very, very stable. And therefore, group sizes tend to cluster around them rather than kind of being completely random. So, OK, just, just to sum up very quickly, most of these ideas were really discovered by asking why animals behave the way they do. And just keep on asking why, 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 like a child does and not making any real theoretical assumptions. In fact, I, sometimes theory gets in the way and distracts us. I think we have to be able to look at what the animals are doing in themselves. Uh, as I said at the beginning, using humans to study things we can't easily do in animals, understanding the differences between primates, um, among the primates and between primates and other mammals was very, a very important thing. Uh, a lot of it has been possible only by collaboration. So collaboration with physicists on the network structure stuff, we've, uh, it's been hugely, hugely profitable. And with neurosciences for the brain imaging stuff, which I couldn't have done myself. And without these collaborations and these contributions, the story would have been much shorter uh, uh, and much more boring. And last but not least, we have to be very, very careful how we ask and statistically test our questions. And most of the kind of attempts to disprove a lot of this stuff has simply been a consequence of people testing their, thinking they're testing one hypothesis, but actually testing the reverse hypothesis, which is, you know, a completely different question. Um, uh, 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 and, and it's because people haven't been paying attention to 
the structure of biological arguments and explanations is, is really the root of the problem. Okay. And this is my new book, it's just come out. It's it summarizes all the human stuff. Um, but of course, there's some primate stuff buried in there. So it's just written for the layman, but it has lots of references. In it. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope I haven't talked for too long, um, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks very much. That was fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm sure that we'll, we'll, we'll have uh, <laughs> some uh, hand claps going on in the Zoom audience here for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd like to open it up to anyone here who has questions in Zoom or anybody who's watching the stream on YouTube. Um, in YouTube, you can ask the questions in the chat box associated with the stream. Uh, in Zoom, either put up your hand or um, type your question in the chat box and I'll get to you. Um, we have a hand already from Zihong, one of our graduate students. So go ahead if you want to ask directly here, Zihong. Okay, now yeah, my background. Anyway, <laughs> hello. Hi. Fascinating talk first. Really amazing to hear these interesting stories. And can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, ahead. okay. So my main question is about, uh, have you ever considered imaginary social relationship while you're studying the social relationship, the relationship between social and brain evolution? For example, we know that some kids might have Im imaginary friends. Yes. And, you know, people might fall in love with a AI program. Have you ever considered that influence? <laughs> yes, this is true. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and there's the, the important thing to remember is at least for humans, I don't think this is true for uh, a, a primate, other primates or other mammals, but at least for humans, because we have such massive um, mentalizing capacities compared to all other species, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sort of on the you know, a scale of mentalizing, the best that any other species can do, and all the great apes can do this, is second order intentionality, as it's called, um, which is formal theory of mind. It's being able to understand what somebody else thinks. Human adults can do fifth order intentionality as their normal average. So they can do much, much more complex mentalizing. We've shown that that affects their quality, capacity to understand literature, their capacity to understand language, all sorts of consequences. But also, of course, it allows them to imagine all kinds of other uh, uh, people, if we want to put it that way, that I can imagine that my dog uh, is talking to me and has a, uh, loves me. I can imagine that some character in a TV soap opera or a film uh, I have a special relationship with, I have, can imagine um, that I have a special relationship with God because I talk to God in my prayers, for example, and he speaks back to me. Um, uh, and, and people do this all the time. And, and there is no requirement that your 150 circle should consist of people. It can consist of anything you think you have a relationship with. Your favorite pony, if you like riding horses, your favorite cat, your favorite dog, your favorite fictional character, your favorite religious character, uh, the saints or whoever. Um, it's just that if you have those in your circle, you squeeze some real people out, that's all. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have a question from Sanjana. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for your talk, it was really interesting. So um, my question was, is related to the, so there's the neurological correlations to social groups and how closely related or how close you are to someone and how these groups grow in size when they're less acquainted to you. So mm -hmm. if you come from a society or a culture where even just the close group are very large in number, for instance, your family itself has like more than 20 people in it. How yep. would this affect your neural process or how would this in general affect your social behavior? Uh, that's a very interesting question for several reasons, actually. Uh, and I'll try and answer two, two different ways here um, because they both make important points. One is this ability to manage relationships does not come for free. It's not part of your 
biological makeup. What, what, what the social brain hypothesis is about is providing you with a big enough computer to handle the processing, if you like, and the software. Um, the software itself doesn't seem to come for free. You have to learn that. And that's why we think you, primates have such a long period of socialization and humans an especially long one. And the brain doesn't settle down, and particularly the frontal lobes, which is kind of the important area in this context for relationships, doesn't settle down to the mid twenties, finally achieves its, its final state. So it's a very long process of learning and practicing the social skills. So the basics are there, but you have to learn how to apply them. Um, so, and, and we know from developmental studies uh, that the more siblings you have, the quicker you learn those processes and probably the better you learn them. So it's a big advantage to come from a very large family. <laughs> um, uh, though obviously such large families are becoming less and less common which is kind of worrying, you know, if, uh, uh, because children learn from their peers. They don't learn from adults how to handle the social world. Um, but secondly, um, uh, if you come from a lot, well, what we've shown with the human staff is that you give priority to family, right? So even in the kind of West where we have much reduced family sizes, typically just one or two children, um, and therefore, your entire extended family, all your cousins and so on, is, is not a small number. You, if you come from a big family, you have fewer friends. And we think that goes back to the fact that this kind of size of grouping some, of about 150, somewhere between 100 and 200, is really the community size in hunter-gatherers. So you see, that's exactly the size you get there. Um, uh, for the extent it's not the living group size, but the, it's the community of several living groups that occupy the same territory, essentially. Um, that it turns out to be somewhere between 100 and 200 in all modern hunter-gatherers. And they're all related to each other. That's a family grouping in most of these. They're all extended family members. And that's exactly the size of grouping you'd expect if you calculate the number of descendants that you would get uh, from uh, 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 um, uh, uh, over the generations um, uh, in, uh, um, in terms of natural fertility populations. Um, so we think that what, what that's trying to get at is a group of basically related people, either as in-laws or, or, or by uh, biological uh, relationship. And that what's happened is as we've reduced family size, uh, and therefore extended family size after the demographic transition uh, in those countries that have been through that, what we do is just fill up the empty slots with friends. Um, but if, as I said, if you come from a big family, even in that context, um, you have fewer friends. It's uh, quite extraordinary. And we can show that with our data. And many people have said that. I remember one lady came to me off after a talk I gave at a science festival and said, this describes my family perfectly. I come from a very large family. I have 40 first cousins. It takes me all my time <laughs> to, to get round them. Uh, and I don't, I have very few friends, but my husband comes from a very small family and uh, therefore he has lots and lots of friends. And I think you find that uh, is very common. The difference is if you come from a big family, you cannot break these layer boundaries, because these layer boundaries, this 5, 15, 50, correspond to emo levels of emotional closeness. Uh, and uh, you will end up having to choose which of your 20 children, <laughs> if you have 20 children, to include in the first five uh, and which to put in the 15 layer. <laughs> so, so you'll have to make decisions. But those, those boundaries and those circles appear to be absolutely sacrosanct. You cannot, you cannot break them. The new perspective for sibling rivalries here, I guess. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed so. Uh, we have a so question. Thank you so much for the question. Sorry? I think she was just saying thank you um, oh, okay. for the question. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kenneth, you have a hand up from Kenneth. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was really fascinating. Um, 
earlier, we were also mentioning that um, all of this, uh, all of what is implied by the social brain requires some learning and we learn till very late. I was wondering to what extent the, this, what that we learned is dynamic and how, for instance, the lockdowns of recent years can impact <laughs> the, our abilities to have such a social brain and train for social interactions. And if we need to keep up um, with this training, would it be a reason why people start talking to their plants when they don't see other humans or something like this? <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to include your favorite plant as, uh, as one of the things, but usually I do. I, I usually mention Prince Charles, uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth's eldest son, because famously he used to talk to his roses to help them grow. And I uh, always say, you know, you can include your favorite potted plant if you like. If you think you, think you have an emotional relationship, that they talk to you, that's, all you, that's a relationship. It's good enough. Um, yeah, so the, the interesting question really has been whether how lockdown has kind of destabilized things. Uh, up to a point, I think it probably has, but only to a limited point, because although you can pick up a decrease in the emotional closeness of relationship after as little as three or four months, probably three or four to six months of not seeing somebody at the same rate, um, in humans, uh, it probably takes a, about three years for somebody to move from, let's say, the 15 circle. This won't happen to your five circle friends because your five circle friends appear to be so cast in stone that they, they will last a lifetime by and large. But the 15 and 50 circle friends are much more fluid and they change constantly. We, we show from our once one of our data sets for 20 year olds, that about 30% of their um, friends change position, that's say from one layer to another every year, right? It's a very dynamic system. Uh, uh, and so it takes a, probably about three years for somebody to go from say the 15 there to just being an acquaintance outside your 150. Um, and that's again, what, what's been shown in, in, in studies of social networks in the US and uh, we've also shown something very similar from uh, our further analyses of telephone, uh, cell phone data set that we have, because we now have three years uh, consecutive uh, data, as it were, from, from that cell phone provider. And um, <clears throat> you can see very, very high rates of turnover. It slows down in middle age. You know, I think the, the turnover is very high in the 20 year olds, teenagers, 20 year olds because they're what I call being careful shoppers. They're trying to check out all the supermarkets to see where the best friends are, right? Uh, you don't want to take the first one. The first one that offers you friendship or marriage, wait. <laughs> Try Check out another first before, before you say yes. Um, and that's what they're doing. And then in their 30s, they cut back uh, dramatically. And the average for 30 year olds is 150. And it's very stable until you get to around my age and Professor uh, Huffman's age, and then it starts to decline <laughs> inexorably down to zero if you live long enough. Um, uh, but but the, 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 the point really is you, you have this constant turnover, background turnover that's going on. Uh, and, um, you know, that's mostly, of course, partly because we choose to spend time with other people we, who, who's a nicer friend, uh, perhaps a more interesting friend, or somebody moves away, you can't see them so often. Um, so these things kind of happen. Now, forced lockdown, yes, it will kind of start to destabilize friendships, but I think it will only destabilize them in the sense that because it's, it's only a relatively short period of time. If it had gone on for several years, you would see dramatic effects. But I think it, it's, it, because it's relatively short, what you'll see is people just a little unsure where their relationship stands now. Have, maybe the other friend has met somebody new in that time, in, in the, you know, living in the same street or something. <clears throat> um, and so there's maybe a little ambivalence. And then, you know, if you rebuild the relationship, uh, everything will be back to normal. And, and we know that happens anyway. We, we've shown from our analyses of, uh, the cell phone data set <clears throat> that if you don't call somebody 
at the usual frequency that you always did. So you always call them every week, uh, let's say. And then for some reason, you don't call them for several weeks. Perhaps you're away, perhaps you're in hospital, perhaps you're in jail, who knows? You don't have the opportunity, you don't call them. The next phone call you make will be much longer, almost double uh, the length. As, it, as though you're trying to repair the relationship and restore it to where it was. Say, sorry, I didn't call. I was very busy. I was in jail, whatever. Um, uh, and now I'm, 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 I'm kind of trying to rebuild the relationship. <clears throat> so we see that kind of thing happening. I, I think the only ones that will have, well, it's possible that teenagers <clears throat> might not have had the social experience that they have, would have had, but I think teenagers are designed to be flexible and resilient. Otherwise, they children would never survive <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if they weren't. They, you know, it, it's a kind of, Children have built-in redundancy, which allows them to compensate for, for different experiences along the way. So I think although they will have had a gap, they are so socially minded, they will just go out and, and do things with each other and, and, and you know, restore the learning process very quickly. Um, I don't think it will make much difference to people older than that, say from 20 right through till about 70. But at 70, I think it will have a big effect because <clears throat> as I said, from about 65, 70, you, you start to lose friendships and you don't replace them. So your social circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you don't replace them because you don't have the motivation, uh, you don't have the energy to go out to meet new people, and you don't really know where to go to meet people, right? When you're young, you just know, go to that club, there's lots of people there. But when you're old, if you, you know, Professor Hoffman and I go to a, a, a dance club, you know, the man at the door will just throw us out. We won't even get in. <laughs> so, so, so uh, you know, and, and we don't, you kind of don't want to go there because if, even if you do, you don't know what to talk about because, you know, these are younger people and they have talk about different things. They have different interests and so on. So, uh, you know, it's very difficult for old people. And I think they will have an accelerated decline, that age group, an accelerated decline in uh, social network size. And one consequence of that uh, will directly be an increase in uh, major disease conditions. So uh, accelerated rates of dementia, accelerated rates of depression, accelerated rates of physical diseases, particularly cancers and, and cardiovascular diseases, because all these have been shown uh, by huge literature to be affected by the number of friends you have above all else, right? All the things your doctor worries about, sure they're important, but the thing that most affects your susceptibility to all these conditions and diseases and affects your sense of happiness and well-being, psychological well-being, physical well-being, is simply the number and quality of close friendships that you have. And we've shown that with, with some of our data, which has published a huge uh, um, uh, longitudinal survey across several European countries, uh, showing that the number of friends you have affects your risk of uh, depression in old people, older people in the future, not, not in the past, <clears throat> so it's a prospective study, and there's a massive medical epidemiological literature on this now. Um, so it's quite frightening how, how important your friendships are to you. <laughs> uh, if you wanna live long and be happy, find some friends. <clears throat> so so for Robin and Mike, that means let's head over to the club so we can test your hypothesis? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth. Um, so I'd like to, uh, before, th there's another question in chat here, but we had a question from YouTube. So Nahoko, can I ask you to come and share that with us? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Dunbar, for your great talk. And I'm about checking the YouTube live stream. And we got the question. I think it's related to social brain hypothesis. So here is the question. Do we have any idea about the confidence interval of the numbers in social network, just to get an idea about human human variety, variability? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, the answer is, if you do 
it, it just depends entirely on how <laughs> you do the regression. And the le object lesson in here is you need to be very, very careful. Because if you just stick a linear regression through the social brain data, because of the scatter in the data due to the grades, you get massive um, uh, uh, confidence intervals. And it depends whether you estimate prediction intervals or confidence intervals, because the two are very different. Um, one is much bigger than the other. Secondly, um, if you, even with the original data, if you do a reduced major axis regression, which gives a much better fit to the data, um, the confidence intervals are still very wide. I pointed this out in the original paper, right? Uh, 30 years ago now. Um, and that the confidence intervals for the estimate on humans group size is somewhere between 100 and 250. Um, that said, <clears throat> uh, if you, it depends how you then ask the question. If you ask the question uh, about, well, you know, sort of what's the likelihood of, of uh, a, 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 a data point for humans occupying that space, it's clearly very wide, almost anything will fit. But actually, it, it what you see in the data set and all the data sets is a very tight bunching around 150. Um, so if you, if you take a Bayesian approach to uh, the statistics, which is asking how good is my fit to the prediction, uh, you can uh, do a much, much finer grade analysis. But what we've learned since we've discovered the existence, being able to show the existence of grades, is it really depends on knowing which grade this, your species falls on, um, which makes it awkward in some senses for making predictions to unknown species, as we did, as I originally did with humans. But the, the um, uh, confidence intervals around the grades are very tight indeed, much much narrower. Um, what we can't do, what we couldn't now do is, is say, okay, well, where do humans fit? Because we don't, we wouldn't have known which grade to put humans on because there's no, it's not a phylogenetic thing. But what having this, what's interesting we can, that we can do is given that we know where humans fit and we know where chimpanzees fit is we can estimate the, uh, I think very reliably the community sizes for all fossil hominids because they must lie between those two values. They cannot lie anywhere else because chimpanzees and humans represent the bottom and the top of the distribution. The, there may be an issue about the exact shape, uh, but the shapes appear to be linear. So, so you know, in all the data we have, so there's huge quantities of data now, show that these um, layers are, are highly, highly consistent. So, you know, I don't believe idiots that don't understand their own statistics, their statistics, frankly. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Nahoko. And, um, okay, so I, I don't know, we're already 15 minutes past our scheduled end. So Robin, I don't know for you if there, you have a time limit you'd like to, us to hurry up on. Um, I, I'm, I'm good. We had one, we do, we do have another question here in the Zoom chat. Um, I'll just ask it while you're ghosting us in Zoom here. Yep, yep, uh, I'm here. So, yep. <laughs> so we have a question from uh, Natsukita. He was asking, uh, thank you, well, he says thank you. And then he's asking, um, if living in groups is stressful and stress can potentially destroy fertility in females, then the group living has a direct effect on fitness. Why and how uh, is it evolutionary meaningful to live in a group? Oh, the answer is very simple. There are things out there in the environment that want to eat you or kill you. Usually those are predators. Predation is the main driver for living in groups in all mammals and, and most birds. Uh, the only exception is where um, uh, group living is forced on you by shortage of suitable habitats. So colonial nesting seabirds, for example, there aren't many rocky islands for them to nest on, so they all have to live together. Hamadryas baboon, uh, sleeping cliffs, there aren't many in the safe sleeping cliffs in their environment, they all have to cluster together. 
Um, it's extremely stressful for them, I can tell you, from having watched them. There's constant fighting going on between neighboring bands occupying the same, so neighboring troops, essentially, occupying the same sleeping cliff. Um, uh, and also, it's clear that in, in chimpanzees and humans, this spills over into attacks by uh, conspecific groups, neighboring groups. Um, uh, the predation is not the issue for their main grouping levels. That, that's dealt with at a lower grouping level in both those species. The, the main community level is, is a response, we think, pretty certain to, to raiding by neighbors. Raiding by neighbors may be a problem in other primates too, but the evidence we have, and it's in the paper that's just come out today, uh, suggests that, um, uh, I think it's in that paper, <laughs> might be in another, that, that um, uh, conflict between neighboring groups doesn't affect uh, the structuring of the groups and the size of groups as much as um, uh, predation risk does. So predation risk appears to be the driver. And we can show with baboons that, uh, well, the other problem is that's created by bonding actually, is it means you cannot leave the group on your own. So in general, for herd forming species, you can come and go as an individual when you want to. When things get too much for you, you can just leave and perhaps go and join a smaller group. With these bonded species like primates and a few other mammals, uh, you can't. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get into a bonded group. Um, and therefore, the only way they can solve the problem of a group being too large is to wait till it's big enough to fission into two halves, which themselves are above the minimum required for predation risk, to cope with predation risk in that habitat. And we've shown with baboons that uh, um, what happens is they oscillate uh, up and down around the target value. But if they live in uh, high predation risk uh, habitats, then uh, they, opt for a larger group size, but only certain group sizes are possible. If they live in a low predation group, group uh, habitat, they go for a low predation risk group size. But what's in really important for these poor, poor species is they cannot maintain a consistent average group size indefinitely. They, 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 they kind of have to oscillate around it. Uh, and it's, it's a non-linear um, oscillator basically. So they increase very, very slowly in group size, pass through the target group size, get to the upper limit and then fission and come back down to the bottom. So it's sort of the fission process causes a dramatic change in group size, but they suffer in fertility at either end. When the group size is too small, fertility is low. And when the group size is too big, fertility is low. Um, that's ultimately what, what's the trigger for the fission, of course. Uh, and we've shown that this is true for uh, baboons, for um, uh, chimpanzees, for gorillas, and for humans. So if you look at the uh, uh, processes of human group sizes um, in community living groups, so we did with Hutterites mainly, who live in, in communal farms in, in the northern United States and southern Canada, um, they target 150 as their ideal um, community size. Uh, but they have the same fission process. So the fission tends to occur at around 170 uh, and drop them down to about 50. But what's interesting is survival of the community without need for further fission in these human communities is much greater if they hit the target sizes of 50 or 150 than if they go somewhere in between. Um, again, suggesting there's something weird about these numbers that makes these group sizes very, very stable. But it, it's, it, you know, it's part of the complexity. I mean, I, it's part of the reason primates have such big brains, I think, because managing this process, I mean, they're not thinking about it, if you like, they're doing it subconsciously if you, as much as anything, but managing that process is hugely, hugely complex. Uh, it's not, not an easy problem for them to solve. Unlike you know, herding species, you don't need a brain to be a herding species. And that's why so many species do it. And we actually have a paper which we modeled this process uh, and showed that these kind of 
layered, structured, hierarchically layered fractal uh, social systems are, will always be very rare. They, they will rarely represent more than 1% of uh, 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 species. Um, uh, simply because they're so costly to maintain. It's much, much easier to have a herding format where you just kind of converge on together when you need to and, and just wander off and do your own thing um, uh, um, when you don't need to, to, to be in a group. And you don't need a brain for that because you only have to remember the people who you actually with on, on the day. But with bonded species, you have to remember who everybody is and how they're related to each other and how their third party and fourth party relationships work for life in a bonded group. And, and what made me realize this was working on a herding species, the feral goats, which do have uh, close relationships and close groups, but also essentially are a herding species. It was just watching what happens there and how easily those groups fragment um, when they don't need to, to, when the animals don't need to be in a group, it made me realize how strongly bonded primate social groups are, particularly the, the kind of old world monkeys and, uh, uh, and apes. Um. Okay, thanks very much. I, I think we should, we should probably start wrapping up the feed here. Uh, there is one more question in YouTube, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Nahoko, do you want to come back in? We're, we're, in, yeah. we're in sort of lockdown. Okay. We have nothing else to do. <laughs> I think the question itself looks pretty interesting too. So, Okay, so here is a question about the social prank. So do you think that social prey can be used to build a larger community in animals like grooming? Uh, um, you mean the social brain hypothesis? Yeah. Uh, is that, yeah, that's what it's referring to. Okay, the answer I don't think is, uh, or I, the answer is no. Um, there are two issues that animals are having to contend with in creating these bonded social groups. One is managing relationships, and it's not just dyadic relationships, your relationship with animal A or animal B. It's managing also, in addition to that, the relationships between animal B and uh, A and animal B themselves and their relationships beyond that, as I've mentioned in answering the previous question, it's the triadic and tetradic and you know, whatever comes after that network of relationships, because you have to be aware that, you know, if I punish you for uh, stealing my fruit that I've just picked, um, that uh, your mother and your uh, auntie and your sisters may come to your aid and I may end up worse off. Right. So it may be just easier for me to say, OK, you're a schmuck, but, you know, have the apple. <laughs> I'll go and get another one. Um, and they have to be able to make those kind of calculations. Right. So so it, 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 it's you know, that's where the complexity of the social brain uh, is coming from. Um, but in addition, they have to engage in this very, very lengthy process of social bonding. And remember, you know, if you look at the distribution of time devoted to social grooming in primates, it's enormous. It varies from something very close to zero in the species, typically monogamous species uh, that don't groom a lot with each other. Some do, but, but uh, you know, some don't. Up to as much as nearly 20%. 20% of the day spent grooming, that's a fifth of the whole day. Is a huge amount of uh, 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 investment in in social time, as it were, to keep your group bonded. Now, if you look at what's actually happening, who you're grooming, you're not grooming with everybody in the group. What you're doing is you're grooming with your main social partners. You're just investing more and more and more in the same little core group. And that core group in all primates turns out to be about five. If you look at the network structure uh, of, uh, of primate groups right across the range of primates, um, uh, and Hiroko Kudo and I uh, published a paper 20 years ago showing this. Um, but we've since done, or I've since done a, a lot more analyses on it. It's very stable across primates at around about five, this core group of coalition partners. Um, I, so what you're doing is you're investing more heavily in your coalition partners in order to sh ensure that they will always be with you and come to your aid when you need it. 
because that's the problem they're dealing with. That's the problem we deal with. It's no good, you know, when your life falls apart, it's no good going out onto the street to some stranger and saying, uh, please help me, my life is a wreck. Because the only thing a stranger will do is get their cell phone out and phone the police. Probably. If you're lucky, they may phone the ambulance. Uh, but then, but if you do the same to your best friends, uh, best friends and family, or closest relationships, they will come to your aid immediately, right? And so what you have to do is set these up long before these relationships up long before they're needed. And that's why you're investing in all this time. That's why monkeys and apes are investing so much time in social grooming, it's to ensure that they then are not abandoned by their best friends, that they will be there to buffer them, but because they need the group as a whole uh, there. So, so it's a very complicated balancing act they're doing. They need to live in a big group, but that creates a stress. So they have to have a small group within that that acts as a coalition to just keep everybody off their backs and stop them kind of just harassing them. This is not fighting, this is just casual harass. It's like being in the uh, uh, subway in, in Tokyo, you know, it, you're being pushed about and people are bumping into you and, and all these kind of things. They're not doing it intentionally. They're not being malicious. It's just density, that's all. And it's just trying to keep them a, a little bit away from you so that they don't kind of stress you out too much. Um, but that, that balancing act is what I think is really the cost uh, of the social brain. That's what the social brain is designed to handle and why it's so expensive. We've, we've, we've shown that mentalizing is much more expensive in terms of neural recruitment than conventional forms of cognition, you know, thinking through a physical problem, simple cause, cause effect relationships of the same scale. Trying to imagine what's going on in somebody else's mind is much, much more expensive now. And then it's, what you have to see this in terms of is the problem that primates in particular, but also things like dolphins and elephants to some extent, uh, are facing the same problem because they also have bonded social groups, um, although they're not as intensely bonded, I don't think, as primate social groups are, is what they're trying to do is not create some cooperative group um, to act in in in. in for protection against predators, as it were. They're not actively defending themselves and predators. They're simply using passive defense because predators don't like attacking big groups of animals that are bunched together. So the problem they're trying to solve is one of coordination, not cooperation. Cooperation comes later in primate social evolution. Um, uh, and the problem with cooperation is just stopping the group from drifting apart. like you know, ungulates do, herding ungulates do. And so you see these mechanisms in species like Hamadryas, where they become very dispersed. They have these behavioral mechanisms which allow them to maintain uh, coordination of travel. So they all end up at the same place at the end of the day. Right? They have these very sophisticated bidding systems and negotiation systems at, at the start of the day before they set out to decide which water hole to go to. Where shall we, which pub do we meet at lunchtime? Is specifically what it is. So that the group does not become completely dispersed and lose contact and then drift off into nowhere in a, in a habitat where there are no refuges because it's very short, uh, scrubby, um, um, uh, thorn scrub, no, there are no trees, big trees to escape from predators in and there are lots of predators around. So this is, you know, this completely bypasses the usual problem we have with trying to understand co the evolution of cooperation. It just doesn't arise. There's no, nothing to pay. You don't, you don't, there's no altruism problem involved here. All you're doing is just trying to prevent your best friends from abandoning you. And then the network allows that process to flow through to the whole group because you make sure your best friend, um, uh, Michael, uh, 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 does, doesn't get too far from you because you spend a lot of time grooming with you. So he's motivated to stay near you. And that ensures that his friend, Andrew, beyond that, <laughs> uh, stays near to him. And that keeps the group together. That's all primates are doing. But that in itself is very time costly in terms of the investment they have to make in the endorphin based bonding system and very costly in terms of 
the kind of cognitive calculations that are, they're doing. Sorry, that's the whole of primate evolutionary theory. <laughs> <laughs> in a nutshell, <laughs> covered in, a nutshell in answer to one simple question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. amazing. Just, just one comment. It's amazing First. when you you think about large groups that that you and I and, and and other people have have studied and looked at, and you realize how true that is. You can have a huge group, and they can know. If, if two groups come together, one like at, at, at um, Takasakiyama in, in, in Beppu down south, um, you can have a troop of 700 and a troop of 500, and they make a space about this, this wide when they're exchanging places in the feeding grounds. Yeah. And yeah. randomly, someone's on that line, but they know who's us and who's them. Yeah. It's yes. amazing that they get that big scale, but you can break it down into small yeah. associations within the one group. And yeah. those things can change according to needs and friends leave or die or whatever. But yeah, and, and, and now you raise that. Um, that. That's a very interesting question. I, I remember when Hiroko Kudo and I were working on the network stuff uh, 20 years ago. We were particularly fascinated by the Takasaki Yama uh, uh, monkeys because of ha having such large groups, you know, the, the Japanese, some of those Japanese macaque populations, particularly the ones around temples and so on and feeding stations, get to these very big group sizes. How do they do it? You know, how do they keep these group size groups coherent? Um, and, for, and we were kind of wanting to do something uh, to look at that in more detail, but in the end, we weren't able to. Um, but it, 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 and really, actually, I was hoping that Nicola Koyama, when she, as my graduate student, went out to study them uh, many, many years ago also, well, actually, it was about the same time, um, uh, that she might be able to, 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 to give us some insights. But it, 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 you know, when you're trying to manage that size of social network, 700 animals, it is very, very difficult. We can't do it with humans either. <laughs> <laughs> without using telephone databases. Um, but there's a great project for a PhD student who's wondering what to study, you know. How are these big groups structured? Uh, it's not, would not be an easy project to do, but it's possible that, it, you know, I suppose you could put kind of Bluetooth uh, uh, um, uh, transmitters on all on all of them and see see who spends time near who. Um, it would be a bit expensive, uh, but we do it with humans now. So you know why not do it with monkeys? And it would be really interesting to see how highly substructured those big groupings are and what it is that allows them to kind of remain together. You know, is it that? Uh, they go to the same restaurant every day <laughs> and the restaurant is very generous. <laughs> um, or what, you know, what, what is it that makes them stay together and what is it that allows them to stay together? I think uh, leaving it on restaurants, you know, at the Primate Research Institute, we do have a good restaurant. I think it's one of the reasons that keeps us together, <laughs> at least around lunchtime and working hours. So I, I can yep. second that hypothesis at least. Um, well, yeah. Professor Robin Dunbar, I'd like to thank you very much uh, again for joining us and giving us this fascinating talk and spending the rest of the time with us answering our questions.